Yeah, so it was a bit of a surprising, confusing moment. Um, there were a lot of uncertainties about exactly what would be allowed in terms of use and supply. Um, because all of it, it seemed quite sudden, the, the shift. People were allowed, were told that they could grow at home, for example. Um, you could also grow for commercial purposes. Um, but then the extent to which it could be made available for sale in a shop, that was unclear. And it took a bit of a while to settle down. But pretty soon after that, people um, people learned that it would um, be accepted for various through various different implicit messages that it would be okay to sell. And so over the past two years, essentially, there's been thousands of shops that have opened, um, making available cannabis, various types of cannabis products for sale for medical and for non-medical purposes, essentially. Yeah. So did that then increase the use significantly or was it just above board? I mean, there's very limited studies that have been done on this, but the limited studies that we have seen have reported an increase in use, um, including including amongst young people. But I have to say that before, when a substance is criminalised, people are less likely to be honest and forthcoming about their use. So it's really difficult to say, I think, this soon in the picture and with such limited research being done, um, really the extent of the growth in the use. And more importantly, I think we would really encourage looking at the impacts of use that there is a lot of concern, particularly amongst young people using, but it's really important to understand what is that type of use? Was it just a one-time experiment um, or is it more of an ongoing use that has a more se severe impact on them, on their health in particular and other social impacts? Yeah. So what is behind this latest push to recriminalise it? Um, it's a political promise, essentially, um, by the current... Um, government in, in power um, that um, despite I mean, it was a it was a fraught election um, last year and they came second in terms of the number of votes and they came out um, basically through a number of events ended up taking government and one of their promises even during the election campaign time was that they would um, make changes to make it more strict again in terms of the rules on cannabis um, and I think the thing is that they were they had to be had to form government in coalition with the same party, the Bum Jai Thai Party, that had championed and, and led the essentially we call it legalization, legal regulation of cannabis that took effect in 2022. And the leader of that Bum Jai Thai Party now is the deputy prime minister and the ministry and the minister for the interior in this government. And when the current um, president, the current government, basically tried to make moves to recriminalize cannabis. The leader of the Bum Jai Thai Party, the deputy prime minister, um, basically pushed back and asked instead for consideration to be given to a cannabis specific act instead of recriminalizing the substance. Yeah. So it looks now like it won't be an outright ban. How do you think they'll frame it? And, um, you know, does that really just allow things to continue as normal? Um, I think it's likely that things will change. So the, what is coming um, now is discussion of a cannabis-specific set of laws that will likely introduce um, more rules around um, who can sell, how you can sell, you know, likely will involve obtaining a licence. Um, I expect expecting around quality controls, um, rules around import, export um, and growing. Um, who can grow, um, what licenses um, will be given to whom kind of thing. I think there's a lot of concern from the advocacy movement here that it will be so strict that local farmers and small business owners will not be able to join in the market um, and that it might end up edging out, um, edging them out, leaving um, a monopoly by larger corporations. So I think part of the um, what they would like to see with the Cannabis Act is basically laws that will allow for a more fair and socially um, just market for cannabis, recognising that cannabis has been used and grown um, for traditional culinary spiritual purposes for a really long time in Thailand, as it is in many other countries around the world. Yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering how popular or unpopular this, this decision is to sort of go backwards a little. 
Yeah, there's a lot of division. I mean, there was a division before when it came through, when it was legally regulated. Um, and that's what led to the, the backlash. Um, people being concerned with younger people using, um, people being concerned with more people in general using cannabis. Um, and I think that it, we'd really like to call on the government to do more to educate people basically around cannabis. I think when for decades people have been told that drugs are bad, drugs are evil, and cannabis is, is one of those drugs, and when you make this kind of change, this really extensive change to the substance, people, there really needs to be space for education, for explanation and for consultation amongst communities um, about the evidence and the science um, around cannabis, its benefits, but also its risks, um, so that people will more likely be on the same page. Yeah. instead of continuing the divisions that we see. Yeah. Yes, I mean, and I think it's an issue that a lot of countries are grappling with. Australia itself is just, you know, what are the benefits of cannabis and how do you manage it without it being a free-for-all? Yes. Yes, for sure, yeah. I think this is something that we've seen for, actually, I mean, Uruguay was the first country to, to legally regulate cannabis, actually, like, years back, and then we see several more and more states in the U.S., um, doing so, Canada, um, we hear more jurisdictions in Europe, um, I mean, certainly in Australia um, and um, in this region too, whether it's for industrial purposes, because the cannabis plant has many different uses um, or medical uses um, or allowing it for non-medical uses even. So I think it's important to continue those discussions, um, to listen to the evidence from people and not to shut them down. and and just say that um, it's bad. And I think it's really important to remember that uh, what we've done in the past is basically criminalizing it and punishing people. And particularly in this region in Southeast Asia has led to really high rates of people in prison. It has led to people being forced into drug rehab programs, people being whipped or caned, and even people being given the death penalty, including for cannabis. In Singapore, a man was executed for um, being sentenced to being possession of over 1.5 kilograms of cannabis. So the, the responses to cannabis range very widely around the world. Um, but it's really important to take a hard look um, based on the evidence that we have. And we have jurisdictions now that have legally regulated and legalized. And in Thailand for the past two years, I think it's really important to have really reflect and look back. Um, how has it been? You know, we thought it would be chaos, but it wasn't chaos, so how was it? And how can we manage it better moving forward without relying on these brutally harsh penalties and relying on police to solve the problem when it really could be more put in the hands of health and social experts? Yeah, that's a great point. Gloria, really interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly.